molecular design and biomimetics. Before ASU, she completed her PhD in chemical engineering at Drexel University and her postdoctoral training at the University of Pennsylvania. The research group integrates biomaterial design with innovative manufacturing to control and direct stem cell behavior for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine applications. She's very committed to service, including recent election to the American Institute of Chemical Engineers Board of Directors, serving on the editorial board of regenerative biomaterials and as a past associate scientific advisor for science translation medicine. She has received many awards, including AICHE 35 under 35 award, Journal of Biomedical Materials Research, Emerging Scholar in Biomaterials, and the Moscow Skeletal Transplant Foundation Biologics Junior Investigator Award. The floor is yours. Thank you. And I'm excited and honored to present to all of you today. Um, today, I'll be talking about a lot of our work that we've been doing in the area of designing uh, biomaterials with spatial temporal control for tissue engineering applications. To give a brief overview of the evolution of biomaterials over the past few decades, um, these biomaterials have really evolved from homogenous kind of metals and polymers to more bioactive and heterogeneous materials, materials that are now being designed to mimic the spatial and temporal complexity of our native tissues and to directly interact with cells in order to encourage the cells to differentiate and regenerate new functional tissue. And so you can see this increase in both complexity and bioactivity over time, and this shift from replacement to regeneration. When we think about the important design considerations for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, there are these three kind of key components. We have the cells. These can be um, cells that are either stem cells or mature, already differentiated cells, as well as whether these cells are coming from endogenous or whether they're being delivered. And then we have the signals that tell the cells what to do. So these can be everything from small molecules to larger growth factors. And then you also have this scaffold. So this is the biomaterial that holds everything together. And here you can tailor a lot of different things from geometry and porosity to not just the degradation kinetics, but also the, me the mechanism of degradation, whether that's proteolytic degradation or hydrolytic degradation. And um, some combination of these three together uh, create the tissue engineered construct. My lab in particular has really focused on ways that we can design the scaffold in particular so that it can better mimic the um, tissue, uh, the extracellular matrix within the tissue. And here's kind of an overview of a lot of the work that we've done in my lab since I've been at ASU. Um, in particular, we've increasingly moved towards designing biomaterials that can replicate more complex signals, whether these are signals um, in space, so replicating the spatial heterogeneity that you see in tissues, or whether this is signals, more dynamic signals, so replicating the signaling that you see um, in the body over time. And I'm gonna tell a few stories in, in both of these areas today. So to start with some of the work that we've done in signaling gradients. First, the reason that this is important is because the musculoskeletal system is, is really connected and complex. And so you can see the um, a drawing of the system here. And as you're walking and moving, you're transferring load from your muscles to your ligaments and tendons, and then your to your bones and back again. Um, and at these transitions between the different tissue types, um, the one, these transitions occur very gradually. Um, but are also sources of injury. And so there's a clinical need to be able to regenerate the transitions between these tissue types. You can see what these transitions look like here um, for a number of different examples. So cartilage bone is um, injured quite often, right? So you may be familiar with osteoarthritis, right? Is injury to this cartilage bone interface. Um, the muscle tendon interface and the meniscus bone interface, these are all examples of um, 
either soft tissue to hard tissue or soft tissue to soft tissue. But in all of these cases, you're changing not just the cell type and the structure, but also the chemistry. As another example, um, here is the tending bone interface. So this is the interface that is torn um, when you tear your rotator cuff. So this is a really common orthopedic injury, one of the most common injuries in the United States. Um, the rotator cuff is a, a tissue in your, in your shoulder, and it typically tears at this tending bone interface. Um, and so you can see here at this interface that we transition from Kind of this really nicely, highly aligned tending tissue, primarily fibroblasts, to this mineralized bone tissue, which is primarily uh, osteoblasts. And again, over the course of this transition, you're changing cell type, um, the physical structure of the tissue, as well as the chemistry. Um, and so when this tissue is torn, Typically, uh, the treatment that is done right now is the tendon is sutured uh, back onto the bone. Um, and as you can imagine, this is not very effective. And so the retear rates can be quite high, depending on a whole host of factors. And so there's been a big push to try to develop um, ways to augment the healing at this interface, this tendon bone interface. And so one um, technique that we've looked at to try to help augment the healing at this interface is using electrospun scaffolds. And we really like the idea of electrospinning for this because they produce fiber scaffolds that mimic the fiber morphology and alignment of native tissues. Um, and here you can see, um, if you're unfamiliar with electrospinning, you have a polymer solution that you um, apply a high voltage to, and this creates electrostatic forces at the tip of this syringe needle. And when those electrostatic forces exceed the surface tension, it'll emit a, a jet. And over time and distance, that solvent will evaporate. And so you'll get the um, dry polymer fibers will be collected onto your collector. Um, you can have a rotating mandrel as shown here, but you can have other types of collectors as well, flat plate collectors. Um, or whatever you would like. Grounded collectors are quite common to both um, help control fiber alignment as well as um, to increase your the surface area over which that you're collecting. So you can see here that depending on your rotation speed, if you're rotating very slowly, you get um, randomly aligned fibers. And if you rotate very fast, do that centripetal force, you get highly aligned fibers. And you see here that the fiber morphology mimics the fibrous nature of both of a lot of different tissues, cardiac and tending tissue shown here as examples. What is also beneficial is that these electrospun fibers, fibrous scaffolds can also be used as patches to augment rotator cuff repair, and that this fits in quite nicely into the already existing surgical procedure. So as I mentioned before, when you tear your tending, um, the tending is sutured back to the bone here. Um, and so the fibrous scaffold can be placed as a patch during this normal surgical reconstruction over the tending bone interface. This has in fact been done for a couple of different types of patches in the clinic. Um, you can see a collagen patch and polypropylene patch shown here. Um, neither of these worked quite well um, in helping to augment the repair. And I would argue that the reason for that is because they weren't really designed to mimic the spatial complexities at this interface, um, nor did they have a lot of, of different bioactive molecules to help increase that regenerative process. And so we propose that by better mimicking the extracellular matrix environment from the tendon to the bone in a patch that you could get improved healing. One of the challenges though is creating materials that have the spatial component in the tendon bone interface. Um, in fact, one of the most common ways um, for electrospinning to control the material properties is through controlling the um, parameters with time. And as, as an example of how this would work, again, if you're thinking back to the rotating collector, um, as I mentioned, when you rotate it very slowly, you get these randomly aligned fibers. 
And electrospinning is essentially this layer by layer deposition process. So if over time you varied your rotation speed, so you started to increase the speed, um, you would then start to deposit on top of those randomly aligned fibers, semi-aligned fibers. And then again, at some later time point, you could again increase the speed. And now you could start to deposit aligned fibers on top of your semi-aligned, which are again on top of your randomly aligned fibers. And you see here that by changing the electrospinning parameters with time, you're changing the, um, the properties of the newly deposited fiber layers. What's important here to realize is that um, we're not actually controlling the properties within a single layer. And so you'll notice that this does not in fact mimic that tending to bone interface where the structure is very tightly controlled within kind of within the length of the scaffold within a single layer. And so we looked to perhaps other developed new methods that would allow us to control the fiber alignment within a single layer during electrospinning. And so we turned to using magnetically assisted electrospinning. So other people have shown that um, the use of permanent magnets during electrospinning could be used to develop these really nicely, highly aligned um, fibrous mats. And so we propose that we could then use magnetic fields to then precisely control where and in what direction we were able um, to get these highly aligned fibers. Um, and again, all within one single fiber layer. And that this could be done in order to mimic that tending to bone interface in terms of the structure. And this work has really been led by recently graduated student, um, Kevin Tyndall. And so here, just showing you a schematic of our magnetically assisted lecture spinning setup. We have the magnet here shown in orange, and then away from the magnet um, in this non-magnetic region shown in green. And we're this actually worked really nicely. We didn't even need um, a high magnetic field. So this is a relatively um, weak magnet about the strength of your typical refrigerator magnet. And what we see here is that we're able to get these really nicely, highly aligned fibers um, over top of the magnet in the magnetic field. And then as you transition away from the magnets to this non-magnetic region, we have randomly aligned fibers. And we're able to quantify this as well. You can see the histograms of the fiber alignment frequency within each of these regions. And you see that um, they're very highly aligned again in the magnetic region and transition to randomly aligned in this non-magnetic region. What's really interesting about this and what we are really happy to see is that the scale bar in that macroscopic image in the top right here, this is two millimeters. So we're quite happy to see that we're able to transition from the highly aligned region to the randomly aligned region at sub-millimeter length scales, which is a unique aspect of this method. Um, and also this mimics the resolution that we see in the tendon bone interface, where that also transitions from one tissue type to the other tissue type at sub-millimeter length scales. And so we were quite happy to see that we were able to mimic um, that, that scale. Interestingly, um, because these are quite weak magnets, as you would expect, again, this is a layer by layer deposition process. So as we're depositing um, fibers on top of the magnet, we're getting further and further away from the magnetic field um, or the magnetic field is becoming increasingly weaker. And when we start to get to a mat thickness of around 400 microns, we start to see that the fiber alignment decreases. And this is because the magnetic field has become so weak that it no longer is driving fiber alignment. Um, nonetheless, this was not um, a inhibiting for our purposes. Um, but if you wanted to create thicker scaffolds, one method would be to use higher um, magnetic fields, or you could also stack these um, scaffolds on top of each other in order to create um, thicker scaffolds. Interestingly, we also looked at different fiber alignment gradients. So we first put two magnets next to each other 
And so if the magnets were sufficiently next to each other, we were able to extend the region that was aligned. And so here we're going from highly aligned over magnet one and magnet two, and then transitioning to randomly aligned um, far away from the magnet. And then of course, if we're able to place the magnets far enough away from each other, we can transition from highly aligned over magnetic magnet one to randomly aligned in the middle and then to highly aligned over magnet two again. So we're really able to control not just the length of the region that is highly aligned, but also exactly in space where we're getting that fiber alignment. Lastly, we wanted to look at more complex fiber alignment gradients. So here we placed the magnets in an L configuration, and you can see here we looked at the fiber alignment frequency as a function of angle in each of these regions, A, B, C, and D. And what's interesting, A is primarily horizontally aligned fibers, C is primarily um, vertically aligned fibers, and you can see that those frequency the angle, the maximum angles where the highest frequency is are 180 degrees apart from each other. What's interesting is that in this B region, you see that gradual change between the A and C. So you see that peak kind of slowly shift from around 84 degrees in region A, where the maximum peak is, to around zero or 180 degrees in region C. And then again, in region D, away from the magnets, we see randomly aligned fibers. We can do other types of um, structures as well. So here's a T shape. And again, we see a similar um, movement of the fibers uh, from the different locations. And A, you see primarily um, vertically aligned fibers. And then when we go to B, because this is a T shape, you see the appearance of these two peaks that correspond to kind of the movement of the um, those fibers. And then in region C, we see that we have this single peak um, around 98 degrees that corresponds to more horizontally um, aligned fibers. And so what's really interesting with this is that we're able to, um, in addition to controlling the length, and in where in space we're getting fiber alignment, we're also able to control the direction of the fiber alignment as well. So this is a super modular technique that gives us a lot of control um, within a single layer of where the fiber alignment is occurring. Lastly, we were interested in ways that we could create interdigitated structures. And so we were interested in this because the um, native tending bone interface is interdigitated. You can see a picture of that here. Um, and we were able to do this quite easily um, by disrupting this electromagnetic field using foil. And so the foil was quite nice to use here in that you know, we can cut different shapes into the foil very easily and very cheaply. And then um, the interface then mimics whatever shape we've we've etched into the foil. And so here you can see that we've recreated this kind of interdigitated structure um, here. And so then we seeded mesenchymal stromal cells onto these scaffolds. And as you would expect, the fibers were highly aligned in the direction of the fibers in the highly aligned fiber region. And they did not display any specific directionality on the non-magnetic fibers, on the randomly aligned fibers. And we were able to look at the cell directionality um, using the same technique that we used for looking at fiber directionality. And you can see here that it directly matches up with our fiber alignment. Interestingly, fiber alignment alone is sufficient to drive stem cell differentiation um, towards tenogenesis. And so we see tending associated genes are upregulated at seven days on these aligned fibers. Um, the scaffold mechanical properties are also strongly dependent on fiber alignment. And so as you would expect, the highly aligned fibers um, in the magnetic region have a higher Young's modulus and um, ultimate tensile strength um, compared to the unaligned fibers. But then the unaligned fibers, right, because they are not aligned, they um, have some 
during the, the testing process, they can become more aligned. And so that movement allows them to have this um, higher ultimate strain. So the unaligned fibers had a higher ultimate strain compared to the aligned fibers. Um, interestingly, we were able to use this technique to spatially align a number of different polymers, polycaprolactone, polyethylene oxide, polyethylene glycol, and cellulose. Unfortunately, alginate and hyaluronic acid um, charged polymers did not align using this technique. So this led us to kind of an interesting question. What is driving fiber alignment here? Um, and so I would like to point out that in none of these studies did we use magnetic nanoparticles. So it was not required for fiber alignment. And so we suspect that it highly depends on the material's magnetic susceptibility and that the presence of ions um, or charged polymers um, inhibits the alignment um, due to the interactions with that electromagnetic field. So in terms of what we were looking at for kind of going on to the next step, um, in terms of choosing the polymer type is we wanted a polymer that was biocompatible, that would align in response to a magnetic field, and that where we could perform post electrospinning photo conjugation. So here, everything that I've mentioned so far has been spatial alignment, but of course we would also like to be able to control chemistry as well. And so we were looking to use norbornene thiol chemistry in order to perform post electrospinning photo conjugation onto these scaffolds to then also control the chemistry. So we chose norbornene modified cellulose for future studies. And so then to look at how we could control the chemistry with space, we looked at a number of different um, into offset electrospinning, which has a lot of strengths in the sense that you can use completely different polymers and solvents. We found that ultimately we could not get the spatial resolution needed um, using this technique um, with our system. And so then we moved towards post electrospinning photo conjugation um, as a method instead. This allowed us to have a much higher spatial resolution, again, sub millimeter. And using this method, we could also tether multiple molecules. Um, one disadvantage is that, as I mentioned, it does require a photoreactive material. So it did limit um, the materials that we could use as potential options here. And it re requires the same base material, which was not a concern for us. So the way this works is, as I mentioned, we we're using norbornene thiol chemistry to do the photo conjugation. Um, so you can see the reaction scheme here. So the norbornene groups will react with the thiol group in the presence of UV light. And so what we can do is we can take our fiber scaffold, swell it with um, thiol containing biomolecules, and then using a sliding photo mask, preferentially expose certain parts of the scaffold to UV light. Um, and then depending on the speed of this sliding photo mask, um, will determine the gradient length. Um, and then we can wash away those untethered biomolecules. We were most interested in ways to create a mineralization gradient. Again, going back to the chemistry of that tending bone interface, we were hoping to recreate the mineralization gradient that you see in that interface. And so we decided to use a calcium binding peptide um, as the biomolecule that we would tether. And then we would immerse the scaffold in simulated body fluid in order to promote in vitro mineralization. And the idea is that the in vitro mineralization would occur selectively where the calcium binding peptide is so that we would then get this scaffold that mimics this highly aligned to mineralized um, morphology that you see in the tending bone interface. Um, so you can see here, we have this in-house design sliding photo mask that allows us to create a lot of different types of gradients from a single gradient to um, a gradient in the middle um, to opposing gradients or multi-directional gradients. Um, and then we can do this onto our fiber scaffolds. And you can see here that depending on the mask speed, whether we varied it here from zero to 100 microns per second, um, that we can control the length of the gradient 
um, again, at these submillimeter length scales. Um, and this gradient length was defined as the distance between no single signal to the high signal. And then here you can see that when we um, place the calcium binding peptide onto these scaffolds, we are able to preferentially control the mineralization of these materials without any um, of the calcium binding peptide. We get very little mineralization. And then with increasing amounts of the peptide, we have higher amounts of mineralization. And we can we can actually create these gradient scaffolds as well. Um, here you can visualize the mineralization using this alzerin red S stain, and you see it's highly mineralized where the calcium binding peptide is, and then it transitions to um, non-mineralized um, where the calcium binding peptide is not present. And so ongoing work is um, evaluating these materials in vitro and in vivo in order to evaluate the cell and um, in vivo response to these different gradient materials. But hopefully I've been able to show you some of the new tools that we've developed that allow us to really precisely control where and in what direction we're getting fiber alignment um, using magnetically assisted electrospitting. We have a number of different projects in this area that I do not have time to talk about today um, using other kind of peptide gradients beyond the calcium binding peptide, as well as looking at creating more 3D fibrous materials. Um, and then lastly, kind of using layer by layer stacking in hydrogels for other types of tissue applications, but the same idea here of, of methods that we've developed to spatially control biomaterial properties. So I'm gonna spend the last half of my talk here going over um, methods that we've developed to temporally control signals um, within our biomaterials. And so the reason that we're really interested in temporal control is because the natural healing cascade is temporally complex. And so you can see here the time course of healing for bone. And you see that initially there's hematoma, a lot of inflammation before fibrous tissue and cartilage formation. And then you get kind of the callus bone formed before this is finally remodeled into healthy, mature bone. And at each of these different stages, different biomolecules are being turned on, off, and on again, um, sometimes in this cyclical manner. And so the ability to be able to turn biomolecules on and off and study when they should be presented during regeneration is really critical in order to improve our current tissue engineering approaches. A lot of different groups have been really interested in this as well. There's been a lot of different chemistries that exhibit temporal control that have been explored for um, different um, tissue engineering applications. Um, everything from the use of covalent bonds to non-covalent bonds to different types of external stimuli um, have been explored. One thing that's um, interesting to, or important to note is that when you think of cell culture and in vivo studies, um, it can be quite difficult to change temperature and pH um, and not and within what's relevant for cell culture or acceptable within cell culture. But also you have to realize that any changes in temperature and pH may also change the cell signaling. So a lot of times those types of external stimuli are not ideal. Um, a lot of really elegant work using light has been done that's been able to show the ability to turn on and off multiple biomolecules um, with, with time. Um, one of the big challenges here is a lot of times this can be really synthetically complicated and complex, and you can be limited in the number of times you can turn things on and off and or the number of molecules that you can turn on and off by the number of um, discrete wavelengths you have access to. And so we wanted to kind of create uh, what we would consider a more ideal in vitro biomaterial platform that would allow us to have spatial control, again, going back to the importance of 
um, controlling properties in space that I discussed in the first project, as well as having full reversibility over multiple cycles, having orthogonal control over multiple molecules, using a single conjugation scheme that was easy to use. Um, and so we thought that such a platform would um, be a significant advance in the field. And so we looked to DNA as a mechanism for doing this. And so the idea was to use, to tether um, DNA onto our hydrogel surfaces through photo patterning, and then use um, DNA hybridization as well as toehold mediated displacement to turn biomolecules on and off um, at specific times. Um, excuse me, this work was really led by Fallon Famasi, who recently graduated and is now at um, Gore. Um, and so I'm gonna walk through each of the different design considerations that we chose for this, for this platform. To start with the base material, we chose hyaluronic acid um, because it's a natural biomaterial present throughout the body. We can easily synthetically modify hyaluronic acid um, to contain the synthetic groups of our choice for the photo patterning, um, but it also doesn't innately interact with any integrin mediated adhesion. So we can precisely also control the, um, that cell adhesion through through integrins, through the addition of say RGD as well. Um, and again, we looked here at the norbornene thiol chemistry that I mentioned earlier. This um, has been used a lot for norbornene hyaluronic acid to control, to photo pattern various biomolecules. And it's been demonstrated that this can be used to orthogonally um, tether in different molecules um, of your, of whatever you desire that have this, again, the key is that the biomolecules need to have this thiol group in order for them to be conjugated um, into the system. And then so we decided to use DNA as a reversible linker. One of the key advantages here is that you DNA is very programmable. And so the hybridization of DNA with its complementary strand is very specific. And so you can essentially pick different sequences that will then only bind or hybridize with their complementary sequence. And so this allows for very high programmability and specificity. Um, and you can have an infinite number of sets of DNA that can be tied to different biomolecules. And then they can also be removed quite easily as well. So here, if we have our hydrogel, and we have our initial single-stranded hyaluronic acid that is photo-patterned, covalently cross-linked onto the hydrogel. We can then add the complementary strand that contains a toehold region, this region in orange, and then the biomolecule. This will hybridize to attach onto the surface with the surface strand. And then you'll notice that this um, toehold region is left unbound. And so we can add a displacement peptide that contains that toehold region. And because it will bind to more of the biomolecule strand than the surface strand, it will outcompete the surface strand. And then it can be washed away. And then the surface strand itself is regenerated onto the surface. So this process is repeatable. So you can add in fresh of the biomolecule strand and go through this process as, as often as you would like. In order to add the peptide onto the DNA, this is quite easy as well. We um, tethered these peptides using copper-free click chemistry. And then here's just some of the nomenclature that we use here. The surface strand, again, the surface strand is, is um, these strands are thiolated, these surface strands are thiolated and then photo patterned onto the surface of the hydrogel via that norbornene thiol chemistry. This allows us to have um, spatial control over that initial photo patterning of these surface strands. And then these surface strands are permanently covalently on the surface. And then we add the biomolecule strands. This is the complementary one is called CB. And then this attaches onto the surface, the signal is on. 
And then we can remove the sing signal with the, with the um, displacement strand. Again, if it's complementary, it'll have a C. And then that strand will be washed away. And then the surface strand is regenerated and the signal is off. Um, so we've also, as controls, did mismatched biomolecule and mismatched displacement strands as well. And we can kind of walk you through our results here. So we see when we have the surface strand and then we add the biomolecule strand with the floor four here for visualization, we see um, a high red signal of that floor four demonstrating that the signal is on. And then when we um, add the displacement strand, that signal is removed and the floor four is no longer visible. If you look at some of our controls, first, if we look at if the signal is on and we try to add a mismatched displacement strand, you'll notice that the signal remains on. And so that signal, the floor four remains and the signal stays quite high. And so this demonstrates that the displacement strand needs to be complementary to the biomolecule strand. We can also try to add a mismatched biomolecule strand to the surface strand. And we see that no signal appears, demonstrating that the biomolecule strand needs to be complementary to the surface strand. And then lastly, we added the complementary biomolecule strand without the surface strand. And we also didn't see any signal, um, demonstrating that the binding was um, very specific and we didn't see any non-specific binding of the complementary biomolecule to the hyaluronic acid surface. This process is very repeatable once so you can see that by adding fresh uh, complementary biomolecule to our hydrogels and then the complementary displacement, we're able to turn the signal on and off over five cycles. Um, and also because this is um, not impacting the cross-linking in any way, we do not see any impacts um, on the elastic modulus of the addition of either the surface strands or the complementary biomolecule strand. And this is a unique aspect to the, to the norbornein thiol um, chemistry. When we photo pattern these um, surface strands onto our hydrogel, um, that UV light does not cause any additional cross-linking to occur during that process. And so that allows us to make sure that we are maintaining our modulus um, when we're tethering these biomolecules onto our hydrogels. And um, because this is so specific, we can have um, independent control over multiple biomolecules. And so you can see here that if we initially um, have both this red and this green biomolecule um, bound onto the hydrogel, um, we see this yellow color um, representing that both fluorophores are present. We can add the displacement for the red biomolecule and that red will be removed and we're left with the green fluorophore. And then we can, in the same step, and this is also quite unique, we can add the displacement for the green and then re-add in fresh um, red biomolecule, and this will switch from green to red. Again, this was done in one single um, addition step. So it's quite nice that we can add and remove in the same step. But this is all to demonstrate um, the orthogonality of the addition and removal of these different biomolecules. We're also able to do this with spatial control. Again, because the original DNA strands are photo patterned, we can use a photo mask initially to control where in space those initial surface strands are patterned. And so here we patterned the surface strand for the red biomolecule um, with these horizontal lines. And then we photo patterned the surface strand for the green biomolecule um, with these vertical lines. So you see this crosshatch pattern. And then we can go through the same steps that I went through recently for without the pattern, where we remove the red, we're left with the green, and then we remove the green and add in the red in the same step. And again, you see the same specificity um, in the addition and removal of these biomolecules. 
So we were really excited about the development of this platform and the ease of use. And so next we wanted to use it to kind of look at how we could temporally control cell behavior. And the first thing that we looked at as kind of a proof of concept was the ability to temporally control cell adhesion. Um, here we looked at um, two different types of cell adhesion, cell-cell adhesion via coherence and cell matrix adhesion via integrins. Um, we can control these different types of cell adhesion through the RGD peptide for cell matrix adhesion and the HAVD peptide for cell-cell adhesion. This HAVD peptide um, is derived from NK adhering and RGD is derived from fibronectin. Um, here we first wanted to characterize how much of the peptide we were tethering onto our material compared to how much we were adding in solution. And this reaction is highly efficient. And so we see an almost complete reaction of the amount of peptide that we add in the solution to what is onto the surface. And we, we did this using a thiol assay. And then we, can, we compared um, the bioactivity of the RGD with and without the DNA linker. Um, and here we're looking at relatively small amounts of the RGD DNA. Um, nonetheless, we see um, that there's no difference between the RGD with and without the DNA, that they're very comparable. Um, and you can see this general trend of as you increase the RGD concentration, we have increased spreading, um, as you would expect. We see a similar um, con similar activity with the HAVD. So again, with increasing HAVD concentration, we see an increased cell area as well. So looking at now using this platform that we've, now that we've been able to demonstrate that these biomolecules are being tethered at the concentration we expect them to, and that they're in fact bioactive, we next wanted to see if we can then use this platform to turn um, cell adhesion on and off essentially. And so here we have initially the RGD signaling is on. Um, and so for this darker red bar shows RGD when it's on for the full zero to seven days of cell culture. And in this second lighter pink bar, RGD is initially on from zero to three days, and then it's turned off from three to seven days. And we, we do in fact see that the um, cell area decreases um, once that RGD signal is turned off, as well as the aspect ratio. And we can see that in these images as well. So we are in fact able to kind of um, control cell area um, using this platform, which is quite exciting. And this is at very low concentrations of RGD. So 50, I think we selected 50 microns for this study. Um, and so that's why the cells aren't super spread, but even with these small concentrations, we're able to demonstrate control over the um, cell spreading with time. Um, next, we were interested in, could we control differentiation with time? And so we looked at osteogenic growth peptide, which is a naturally occurring peptide, and this regulates um, proliferation, osteoblastogenesis, and mineralization. And so here you can kind of see in these controls with increasing um, concentration up until about one where you have peak um, uh, differentiation or alkaline phosphatase activity. Um, and then it decreases at this um, really high concentration of OGP. But we see that this um, OGP concentration really does regulate alkaline phosphatase expression, which is an early marker for osteogenesis. Um, and so now we can then look at the temporal effect of OGP on um, alkaline phosphatase activity. And we notice something here that's like quite interesting. So the first bar in each of these sets is if the OGP is presented only in the first week. So we have this early presentation. And then this middle bar is if OGP is only presented late. So this delayed presentation only from day seven to 14. And this final bar in each set is if the OGP is constantly on. So it's on for the entire zero to 14 days. And what we notice is that consistently for these earlier concentrations, 0 0.1 and one, we see that the um, highest activity is 
in the group where OGP is presented um, in a delayed fashion from seven to 14 days. And this is really interesting because I think it has a lot of implications for how we are delivering growth factors and other um, induction factors in order for tissue engineering applications in the sense that you don't want to deliver these factors immediately um, because I think that then they can um, cause differentiation to happen too soon where you may want um, to time the differentiation at a specific point um, in the healing process. And this in fact mimics what you see in vivo during the natural healing process is that these factors are typically not presented early on during the healing process. And so this is perhaps not unexpected, um, but it's nice to see that this platform allows us to study this um, and to learn more about what factors are important at what times during the healing process. Um, and so with this, this um, we're really happy about this platform that we've developed that allows us to have spatial control um, using the norborning thiol chemistry, full reversibility over multiple cycles, as well as orthogonal control over multiple molecules using a relatively um, easy to use and, and single conjugation scheme. And so lastly, I just want to really quickly go over some kind of other work that we've been doing that's combined some of the um, work that we've done in the first project with some of the work that I've, I've recently just talked about. And that's when we've, I've spent a lot of time in the first part of my talk mentioning that um, structure was really important and how we can control structure um, in space. But what about controlling structure in time. And so here we're really interested in can we get dynamic or temporal fiber alignment in fiber hydrogel composites and how can that control cell behavior? And the general idea here is not only do you have these different um, molecules that are temporally regulated during the healing cascade, but you can see that the physical structure is also um, temporally regulated during the healing cascade. So is it important to present specific physical cues at specific times during that healing process? So in order to do this, um, we electrospun um, fibers that contain super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, and then um, we produce this fiber map, and then we were able to use a cryotome to chop these fibers into short fibers. And this cryotome could then control the length of these fibers. And then we could encapsulate these fibers into a hydrogel before subjecting them to a magnetic field in order to control fiber alignment. And so I'm going to first focus on how we've made these uh, materials. Um, but the general idea is that by being able to trigger alignment, we'll be able to trigger cell differentiation towards specific phenotypes. And this will um, allow us to have temporal control over cell differentiation. So here, just to look at our um, magnetic nanoparticles showing that they are nanoparticles. Um, and again, this is just to show that we're able to generate these short fibers, that the size matches um, what we would expect from the cryostat setting. And then we looked at two different systems, one case where we have this static hydrogel, um, which is the Norha hydrogel, the norbornene modified hydrogel that I already mentioned. This is where a case where we would cross-link after we performed the fiber alignment. So this locks the fiber alignment in place. And then we also looked at a dynamic hydrogel. So this is one where, because the bonds within the hydrogel are dynamic, we can um, add the magnetic field to the, the cross-linked hydrogel in situ to allow temporal control over fiber alignment. Um, and so the way the dynamic hydrogel, since that's newer, I'll just go over this quickly. We used a guest host hydrogel um, with adamantine and cyclodextrin. Um, this forms a guest host complex, which um, rapidly, the guest host complex itself rapidly forms. So it's self-healing, but when you, um, provide a force, these complexes will shear, and so it'll go to the liquid form, um, and it can go back and forth quite rapidly. Um, we can see this in this cyclic strain 
um, time sweep where we add a low strain, we have a gel, we add a high strain, it turns into a liquid, and this is quite repeatable. And you see that the transition from um, liquid to gel and back and forth is quite fast. So rapid self-healing, rapid shear thinning. Um, and then here we see that in the presence of a magnetic field, we're able to, this is before magnetic field exposure. This is in the static hydrogel precursor solution. So before cross-linking and then after magnetic field exposure and after we've cross-linked and locked these fibers in place, we're able to, if you look at these um, 360 degree histograms, you're able to see kind of the random alignment before magnetic field exposure and then the alignment of these fibers after magnetic field exposure. We're able to quantify this as a function of spion content and magnetic field exposure time. And you see here that we're able to get um, significantly um, increased fiber alignment um, after applying a magnetic field time of around 30 minutes. We also looked at this for the dynamic hydrogel. And so this is really unique and exciting because we're applying the magnetic field to an already cross-linked hydrogel. And so in this case, this allows us to trigger fiber alignment at any time after the hydrogel is gelled. And again, you see in this before magnetic field exposure, we see this random alignment in this 360 degree histogram. And after magnetic field exposure, again, you see the alignment of these fibers. Um, and this is most visual in, again, this, this histogram here. So we're quite excited about the direction of this newer project um, and how this may be able to help us understand the temporal role of these physical cues during the healing process. Um, and so with that, I will conclude this project. And I just want to um, wrap up by acknowledging my lab, um, as well as all of my collaborators and funding sources. And with that, I can take any questions. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk, Professor. One question came in. What is the maximum thickness you can make using magnetic assisted alignment? So I guess with the, we didn't try higher magnetic fields than the kitchen magnets. Um, just because for our purposes, um, we didn't need thicker um, scaffolds. But so we we got to just under 400 microns, but I expect with a higher magnetic field strength that you could get it to be higher. We, we haven't confirmed that yet though. So it's on our list of things to do. Thank you. Uh, another question is, did you try photoreactive collagen materials? In general, in general terms for natural biomaterials, what happens to these gradient structures after hydration? Is the structure retained? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a good question. Um, so when we've used, so we've done a lot of work, um, electrospinning hyaluronic acid, and you can get aligned hyaluronic acid, um, and, and even with the cellulose, when we've, we've done it with the cellulose, when it's magnetically aligned, but you can get aligned hyaluronic acid just by rotating the mandrel. Um, and we've swollen these scaffolds in PBS. Um, and they maintain their alignment. Although, of course, especially the hyaluronic acid, the fibers do swell and take on water. And so the fiber diameter becomes larger. Um, so we we do see the fibers can swell, but we do not see that they lose um, the overall fibrous mat morphology. One of the reasons for this, especially for the... Um, for these like photoreactive polymers that we're using is we cross-link them after electrospinning. So we get inter-fiber cross-linking as well as intra-fiber cross-linking. And that helps to, I think, keep the fiber morphology intact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This question came in. What is the most important point of using fibers instead of films in your uh, approach? This is a good question. I think one of the main reasons that it's important is one, it allows for a higher um, porosity and also it allows for a 
um, that it mimics the fibrous nature of the extracellular matrix better. So it provides a fibrous structure that I think is important for um, maintaining or kind of mimicking that extracellular um, environment. Thank you. What are the advantages of using osteogenic growth peptides in this project? Also, what other cell types can you use it except for the MSC cells? Mm -hmm. So a good question. So here we, this platform, we mostly looked at it with peptides. And so OGP was really um, advantageous for us or interesting to us because it's a naturally occurring peptide. And we can easily tag on a cysteine so that we can um, conjugate it onto our surfaces. I think we're moving towards and an increasingly interested in how can we um, temporally control full length proteins. And so that's where we're going. Um, so maybe check back in in a year or two and I'll be able to share some of that data. But um, I think the we would love to do this with other types of biomolecules. Right now, this system that I presented here is optimized for any type of peptide. And again, we were most interested in OGP because it's a naturally occurring peptide. Thank you. Um, great presentation. Have you tried any of these hydrogels for organoid culture? I have not personally tried any of these for organoid culture, but I know hyaluronic acid has been used for organoid culture. Um, I don't recall necessarily any of those specifics offhand, but I know other groups have looked into this. Um, it's just not something that that we've done yet. Thank you. Um, how, mechanic, how mechanical strength is varying when you prepared L-shaped electrodes bond fibers with magnets? Yes, so I think that this is a great question. And we do in fact have, um, we, you know, we, we have looked into looking at the localized strain during tensile testing so that we can have a better idea of how the mechanics or the strain changes in space with the varying alignments. Um, but you would expect that in the regions where it's aligned, it is going to behave quite differently mechanically than in the regions where it's unaligned. Um, we haven't looked at that yet beyond kind of the the just the unidirectional gradient that we've tested, but it would definitely be interesting to look into. If you look into the magnetic strength of spion electrospan mat and short nanofibers, did you notice any changes in the strength after cryo cutting? Mm. This is a good question as well. We did not. I don't think that we've actually tested the tensile modulus of the fibers with and without spions. What we have done is we've tested the hydrogels with the fibers and without the fibers in compression. And we have not noticed a significant difference in modulus with and without the fibers um, in the hydrogel. The reason for this is we are adding the fibers at a fairly low concentration, one weight percent. And it wouldn't be expected that the fibers would contribute significantly to the compression modulus. That being said, I think it's a great point that the tensile modulus of the fibers themselves may be different with the spions. And so that's something that we should probably look into. Thank you. Thank you. What are the possibilities of controlling inflammation reaction using peptides tethering like avoiding pro-inflammation and promoting anti-inflammation? This is also a great question. We haven't looked into the use of peptides to control inflammation um, using any of these approaches here. Again, we we recently have started to get into this um, using other materials and other types of peptides. And so we are interested in how you can control um, inflammation during the healing process, but it's just not something that we've looked at with these systems or with peptides in particular. Um, 
So I don't have a great answer for that, except again, that it's something that we're looking into in other areas. And so I hope to have some data and some news to share with you along those lines in the future. Thank you. Um, was there an interference between the high voltage supply and the magnetic field being generated by the magnets? Mm -hmm. um, this is a good question as well. The So these magnets were um, permanent magnets that were on the collector. And the high voltage source was on the polymer, which was um, like 10 to 18 centimeters away from the magnets. So in our case here, the um, the electro the electrical source was not close to the magnetic field. All of this being said, one of the other things that we're interested in is the use of electromagnetic fields to control fiber alignment instead of permanent magnets. This would give us a little bit more control over where the magnetic field is, what the direction is, what the strength is. And then certainly that may be different in the sense that the um, the way that's set up is quite different. And so that's that would be something that would be important to consider, I think, with an electromagnetic system. But for our permanent magnet system, we didn't um, see any um, issues with that. Thank you. How did you place the magnets around the rotating mandrel? They had adhesive on them. Um, so we were able to just stick them on. Um, and so it was quite easy. Um, again, they weren't, the magnets weren't very heavy. They weren't very strong. We have some like rare earth magnets that we use for some of the later stuff that I showed you for the hydrogels. Um, those have to be, um, have to be kind of, you know, we have bore a hole through those magnets and we have like systems to help make sure they stay in place. Um, cause those can be a little bit more harder to move around. Um, but the, luckily with the magnetically assisted electrospinning, those are really weak magnets. So with some adhesive, like double-sided tape, it's quite easy to stick them on things, which is nice. Thank you. Final question. At the post-processing point where calcium was added to the fibers, how effective is this method compared to blending it with the polymer solution? right from the solution preparation stage. Yeah, so um, one of the common ways that people spatially control by spatially control is again, yeah, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning of the talk is they can do blends and then they can control um, the combination of say that blend with the, they can, yeah, they can control the chemistry within the syringe over time. And so you, you couldn't, in theory, start out with like a little bit of the peptide and then at the end have a lot of the peptide in your syringe so that you're kind of depositing layers with increasing peptide concentration. So people have done that before to control the chemistry with the depth of the scaffold. And so for us, because we really needed to control the chemistry within a single layer, photo patterning seemed like the better option. Um, we didn't, we couldn't think of an, e an easy way that the blending would work in order to have um, spatial control within a single layer. So that's why we chose to do the post um, electrospinning photo conjugation. Thank you so much. That's all the questions I have. Appreciate your time, Professor. Thank you. The questions were um, all very insightful. And so I appreciate um, everyone being here today and all of your questions. Thank you.